before we make our first class, I just wanted to reiterate some of the things we talked about in our lessons about way, the way in which we make classes, we describe them, we define them. So here's a UML diagram which is coming from the Visio software. And it's very straightforward and it shows just very simple associations between, between uh, classes and some that sit and do things on their own. So what I've got is a person class and that person class generalises everything we need to know about a single entity that can be treated as one thing and one thing only. So this one has three members. It has its name, which is the compulsory member. It has its data members, sometimes known as attributes and its method members, which are the things that they can do in this class with this data that it contains. So this is our base class, or our parent class, sometimes called. Now from this class we're going to inherit a new class called a student. Now a student also has a phoneme, a surname and a date of birth. But they might have a student reference number, which is a string. So that's an inherited class and so therefore everything that the student has, has access to the person, every piece of data there. So from this we've got two methods, get details and enroll on course. And then we've got a further inheritance where we say from a student there might be different types of students, one of which might be a full-time student. And for that we only need data about their course number. Now this is actually where I'm going to be talking about the stuff that we're going to do today. This is what we might call a factory class, and a factory class generally, not always, has zero or few data attributes or data members, but it has a lot of jobs to do, or a single job to do. Often what we do in commercial applications is we'll have a class that manages the connection to the database, and that's its only job. And what that means is that we can make that, that if we make a different connection to a different database, we change it in one place and it's available to all of the application without anything else having to be changed. Do not repeat yourself, do things once. So that's just a, a brief explanation of the, of the things that are commonly talked about. We're going to do a lot more of this, but this is just a factory class. It doesn't sit directly contacting or connected, sorry, to any of the other classes, but it has a job to do that these other classes may depend on. Creating a class in C Sharp WPF is really easy. And one of the reasons why I'm doing this class first is that it is kind of needed in a lot of the operations that we carry out. It's a factory class and it's, a lot of operations will, will use this if we use more than one database file. And you've seen it before. You saw it last year, we used this exact technique last year, so I'm just using this almost as a reminder. I'll still include all of the talk through on everything that you need to remember about this class, but it should be quite clear to you because you've seen it before. So what we do is we right click the project where we want to put the class. Add. And we are in class, right out of the bottom. Of mine, don't know whether it is on yours. Not sure I care but it's on mine at the bottom. So I'm going to call this class import data. And let's remind ourselves of its purpose. We're using text files as our database and we need to get the relevant text out of those text files so that we can use it in the application. So here we have our class and the first thing we usually do is we add public. So that makes it available throughout the application and when we do our methods that we're going to do, or just one method in this class, we're going to make it static, public and static, so that we don't have to create an instance of import data in order to get the method. Now what is good practice in making classes is to make sure that each one has a descriptor at the top and this is where excellence comes in and the higher marks are achieved. I've got it on the clipboard, so I'm going to put it in here. And what you do usually, and kind of it doesn't matter what format you use as long as it's a consistent format in every class that you create, we're going to put class name, author, the date it was created and its purpose. Now you can also add things to this table of data, but that's the kind of the core data. You might put another line down below which says 
modified and then a new date would be put in. And then you might even put a little table of data which says, you know, different revisions, testing and all that sort of thing. But you're going to put data in here so that you can um, describe what the class is doing. Now this particular class needs some extra directives. Now these are the directives as you know and because this one deals with external data we need to add some new directives. So those are our new directives. System.data, system.io in and out and system.regular expressions. Now you can remember maybe from last year that we use regexes to split the split the rows out. Regular regular expression is called regex. And so we do that to split our rows out. Now none of them are in use yet, but we will be using those three. And I think that's the only three we do use in this class from memory. Right. So we've created our class, we set up the descriptor, and we've got the three directives that we need. Now I knew these in advance. These directives will sometimes appear when the when the application class complains. I don't know anything about that. So you need to find the reference that you've that you've got to add. And in fact, Visual Studio with C Sharp is really good at recommending what, what directives need to be added. So that's us started. So let's create the signature for our method, our single method that's going to be part of this class. And I've got it on my clipboard and I'll just explain it all in a minute. So it's a public method available throughout the whole of the application. It's static. It means that you don't have to make an import data and then use it. You just use it straight away. It's going to be of data type data table, which is part of this directive here. And the function is called, the method is called get text file data. And what it needs in order to get that data is it needs to know the path to that data. Where does this text file exist? So, as you will remember, our methods are, are inside the main class. That's the name of the class. That's the end of the class. And this is what we need to put in here. Right, so the first thing we need to do is describe the variables that we need to use in our class. So here they are. We need what's called a stream reader. And a stream reader is used with a text file, which is a stream of text, a stream of digits, a stream of characters and information, and separators that allow you to sit to take those individual bits out of it. So it's a stream reader and we're going to call it SR. That's the name, that's a variable name and it's a new stream reader uh, and it's going to use the file path. And then it's got a comment to say, read the first line only for the column headers. That's, that's you remember, if you remember, username and password. We're going to get a string array, which is the split from those headers that we've just read. Then we declare the data table that we're going to need to hold the data that's returned and we've called this data table DT. So the first piece of the text file we're going to deal with is the headers. I've got a kind of a style that I like to use for my comments because it just separates them out a little bit. So I like to do that. So I'm just going to paste the code in for this. So for each string header, in the headers array that we've just read, we're going to create columns for our data table and each for each one that we find, we're going to add a header column, a column to the, the, the header name to the columns. So that's how we do that. So let's move on. So what we're going to do now is loop through this data table or the file stream, sorry, to put the rest of the data into our data table that we are creating. So, read the remaining data into the data table up to the end of the stream. So this says, while not stream reader end of stream dot end of stream. So we then use our regexes to make sure we can identify all the characters because when it deals with commas and spit, it's mostly spaces, it can find it quite difficult to interpret whether that's supposed to be a piece of data or whether it's a separator. So that's what that string line does there. A string of array. We're going to make an array of string called rows, and that'll be each row of data in the file that we're, we're reading. Data row equals data t, dt data table new row. And we go through that, the headers, and then we split it out with that way. So we add the rows 
that we find. So what we now need to do is quite simply to return all of the data that we have found. So I've pasted that in there, return the data table from the method return dt. What that means is that when we've now used this, what we can do is we can send this data table into a structure, into an algorithm, where we can take it apart and check whether one of the rows we're looking for is in it. And that's what we do with a data table in our circumstance. Effectively, we're going to have an array of items of data, which are going to be the usernames and passwords of the various users that are registered in, this, in the database, in the, in the text file, and return them to us so that we can now go through them and look for things. The last thing I want to do is to show you how to add a certain type of comment. Now this is very useful for methods because it describes the the, the, the structure of the, uh, the method and what it needs in terms of par parameters. So if I do one, two, three, it's automatically created for us. So what we would normally do is put like that. So that gives us the summary of the parameters. And sometimes that's really useful if there's if this method is taking in six or seven uh, different parameters of different types. And why it's particularly useful is that there's an automated system that you can use with Visual Studio and C Sharp. And these particular types of comments with the triple forward slash form the basis of the help documentation. They automatically look for those a bit like you do when you use a, an index in a Word document. The different styles of text are the things that go into the index or the table of contents, sorry, table of contents really, in a, in a Word document. And this is very much the same. And there's a piece of software that you can use to start to create help documentation. Really good for technical documentation. Although, you must be careful, especially if it's sensitive, how much you reveal when you create the documentation. So we'll move on now onto a different class and we'll, we'll work from there, just gradually putting all of the background classes in place so that we can start to create our GUI and use our application.